It's 1992. The beastly Mercedes 190E Evo 2 has just won the DTM Championship after eight years of trying, failing, and trying again to grab hold of the crown. The Championship's Group A regulations have given rise to some of the most famous battles between some of the most famous cars in the world. Cars that you and I might even have seen out on the street, if you're very lucky. But times were changing. DTM was looking to the future, and the future they saw didn't include the Group A formula that had enraptured fans for nearly a decade. They sought to free manufacturers from the shackles of true road homologation. The sun rose on a new era. Class 1. The rule changes proved controversial amongst manufacturers, with BMW calling it quits completely, leaving the E30 M3 in the hands of privateers only, while Opel and Audi developed new cars, despite continuing to um and ah about actually committing to the championship. Mercedes, however, stood firm. Their car was great. It had just won the championship. Why make a new car? Well, their answer came quickly. It was a vivid red, made a monstrous sound, and left everybody else coughing in its dust. This is the story of the Alfa Romeo 155 V6 Ti. The new Class 1 rule set introduced for 1993 was a major departure from normalcy for DTM. Since its 1984 inception, the championship had operated under the Group A rules, meaning entrants had to be pretty closely related to a road car people could actually buy. The new Class 1 rules, by comparison, were far more lenient. The rules suggested the car's silhouette should be similar, and some components of the structure and body should be similar, but crucially aerodynamic components and powertrains didn't need to be much like their road-going namesakes at all. And a couple of manufacturers saw this as an opportunity to dethrone the previously dominant forces of Mercedes and Audi if they decided they wanted to compete. I've seen the argument that the 1993 rules weren't really pure Class 1, and instead some people choose to refer to it as Group A+. However, for all practical purposes, this distinction is meaningless. Alfa Romeo was one of the manufacturers looking to try their luck. Alfa have a strong history in motorsport, and indeed a strong brand amongst car enthusiasts. Known for their great looks and their soulfulness, code for poor reliability of course, though in modern times I'm sure this isn't so true, it seemed that a high profile touring car series like DTM would make a great fit for the company as it sought to bolster its brand. Their new small saloon, named the 155, was clearly aimed at customers who wanted something a bit more interesting than the aging Mercedes 190 and more exotic than a 3 Series. So what better way to convince customers than to have it beat the Germans in their own racing series? Alpha grabbed a 155 and promptly threw most of it away keeping only what they absolutely had to in order to meet the regulations, which wasn't very much. While you could buy a 155 with all-wheel drive and a 2.5 litre V6, buyers and reviewers were underwhelmed by the car, many bemoaning the fact that there was no real rear-wheel drive configuration, front-wheel drive or four-wheel drive were your options. This was of little bother to the engineers working on the race car, however, as the only rule really standing in their way was the engine regulations. I won't bore you too much. In a nutshell, manufacturers were limited to six cylinders, two and a half litres of displacement, and the engine block had to be made out of the same material as the car's road-going counterpart. Happily, beyond this, they could do pretty much whatever they liked. So a quick valve count will reveal that the race car had double that of the road car and a new aluminium cylinder head. The 24 valve, naturally aspirated racing engine put out a substantial 420 horsepower and paired with an all-wheel drive system, the 155 V6 Ti was looking on paper to be formidable. So that's the V6 part of its name dealt with, but what does Ti mean? 
Turismo Internazionale, which translates to international touring, and international it certainly was. Many were skeptical that the Italian outsider would really be able to compete against his super heavyweight German rivals, but Alpha weren't invited just to make up the numbers, they were in it to win it. The championship winning 190E 2.516V EVO 2 that Mercedes carried forward into 1993 weighed a substantial 1,340 kilograms. Alpha, not constrained by Group A homologation requirements, made a vaguely 155 shaped body out of mostly carbon fibre, bringing their car down to a dry weight of just 1,040 kilos. Mercedes may have miscalculated how urgently they required a proper Class 1 car. Okay, so Alpha had a car that weighed less, had more power, and had all-wheel drive. How could they possibly lose? Well, to save you the surprise, they didn't. Alfa Romeo's factory team, Alfa Corsa, entered two cars. One would be driven by Alessandro Nannini, and the other by Nicola Larini. A couple of privateer teams got their hands on the car too, but we can safely forget about that for the time being. Things started out well for the Italian hopefuls, with Larini scoring a double win in the rainy opening round at Zolder. A privateer 155 in the hands of Christian Danner took second place here too, in both races. Four-wheel drive had immediately proven its worth. In case you're unsure what I mean by double win or both races, DTM, at least in this iteration of the championship, ran two races per weekend at the same track, differentiating it from the norm. Keeping in mind that each weekend hosted two races will help the results make more sense as we move forward. Mercedes being the only other factory entrant into the season that year, at least from the start, realised fast their old car was too old. They couldn't rustle up a brand new car overnight, but they could certainly take a blowtorch to the one they already had, so that's what they did. Now, I hate to break the flow of the story, but this is important. I can't find a source that says exactly what race Mercedes implemented the changes, but for the season overall, both AMG Mercedes and Zack Speed ran both the 190E Evo 2 and the so-called 190E Class 1. But when they made the switch, I can't be certain. I will from now on refer to the Mercedes as simply the 190. Also, while we're having this quick aside, there was more than just Alphas and Mercs on the track, but all the others were privateer entries, at least until race 10. You with me? Good. Let's move on. Actually, just one more thing. If you want to support Automobilistic, consider becoming a channel member. I love making these videos, and if you enjoy watching them and can afford to do so, consider tapping the join button below this video to support the channel. You'll get access to members-only channels in my Discord server, which is linked below, as well as occasional exclusive content. A huge thank you to my existing members, and now back to the video. Bernd Schneider, in a Mercedes 190, wasn't going to go down without a fight, and managed a mighty double victory in round two at Hockenheim, relegating the Alphas to 8th and 9th in race one, and a much closer, but still not victorious, 2nd and 6th in round two. Larini won round three's first race at the Nürburgring, but retired from race two with an engine failure, handing victory to DTM champion Klaus Ludwig, driving for Mercedes AMG. This was repeated at Wunstorf, where Larini won the first race, but retired from the second, this time running out of fuel. I don't know exactly what happened. Kurt Team, racing for Zack Speed's outfit, took victory in the second race in a 190. Alfa Romeo were doing well, there's no doubt, but we'd been promised domination. Even taking full advantage of the new rules, would Alfa really be able to upstage the Germans at their own game? Round 5 at the Nürburgring saw Larini take back the top spot in both races, followed by another double victory in round 6 at Norris Ring, then another win at Donington Park Race 2, where his teammate Danner had won the first race, though this round didn't count towards DTM Championship points for some reason. At Deep Holtz, Roland Ash in his Mercedes won the opening race, briefly interrupting Alpha's run, before Larini mounted a memorable recovery to take victory in race 2, helped by some rain that brought out the best in the four-wheel drive 155. By this point, 
it was pretty clear that Larini was likely to take the 1993 championship, a feat that was, in hindsight, pretty much a guarantee from the beginning, given the lack of substantive opposition. Larini won the first race of Singen, conceding the next three races to Mercedes, before his Alpha Corsa teammate Nanini won the final two races at Hockenheim. It had truly been Alfa Romeo's year, with Alfa Corsa driver Nicola Larini taking a well-deserved championship victory for the team, the only team to have a car truly made for the rules, and willing to take full advantage of that fact to get one over on the Germans. But how would the 155 Ti fare the following year? The short answer is not exceptionally well. Don't get me wrong, Alfa and Larini were still plenty competitive, but with Mercedes creating a new, proper Class 1 car for 1994 and Opel entering the fray too with their own four-wheel drive machine, the opportunities for domination dried up for Alfa Romeo. They weren't exactly complacent. The 1994 155 Ti had some significant upgrades over the 1993 car, most notably in its suspension and braking system, but the leap made by Mercedes proved too big. Larini managed to grab third place in the 1994 championship overall, losing to a dominant performance by Klaus Ludwig for Mercedes AMG and a slightly less dominant but still better than everyone else performance by Jörg van Ommen for Zag Speed. 1995 saw Larini and Alfa Romeo by proxy fall down the order even further, managing just sixth place in the championship overall, a fall from grace for the Italian team. In 1996, DTM rebranded, becoming the more international ITC, which stood for International Touring Cars. This saw races in places so far afield as France and Italy, even venturing to Finland for round four. Despite Alfa Romeo changing their engine partway through the season to a PRV-derived unit, away from the Busso that they had been using since 1993, the results refused to swing their way consistently enough for the championship to be within grasp. Alessandro Nannini was Alfa's man that year, with Larini posting a very disappointing 11th place championship finish, but Nannini still only managed third. The problems were bigger than that though. The internationalization of DTM, along with the supposedly freer and less restrictive rules, had seen the cost to compete soar. At the end of 1996, Alfa Romeo and Opel withdrew from the competition, as they together represented two-thirds of the competing factory teams, the championship folded. The 155 V6 Ti may not have achieved the heights that Alfa Romeo had hoped for, and it could easily be argued that the season that it did win wasn't exactly on merit alone, but I'm going to defend them here. If Alfa Romeo could sort out a Class 1 car for 1993, they shouldn't have their achievement taken away from them on the grounds that nobody else could get their act together fast enough. Would they have lost to a full Class 1 effort from Mercedes? Probably, but it doesn't matter. Mercedes was slow, Alpha was not. And let's not forget, maybe the most important point of all, the 155 V6 Ti looked awesome. Ultimately, it served Alpha's goal. There's no doubt in my mind that the perception and legacy of the at first underwhelming road going 155 was hugely boosted by their success in DTM. Even if in reality, the cars only shared a name and a shape, they became cool by association. If you haven't already, you should watch this video about the Mercedes 190e Evo 2. If you have, you should watch this instead. Thank you for watching. Support the channel by becoming a member to get exclusive benefits, or just subscribe if not. Until next time, goodbye.